Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Women's AM. This morning, I'm joined by sisters Yasmin, Nusrat and Mayameen to discuss the issue of FGM. And don't forget, if you have something to share with us on this topic, please do call in. The number is on your screen now, or you can tweet us at Islam Channel, hashtag WAM15. Um, so, Sister Mayameen, I'm going to come back to you. I think we've had a really uh, kind of interesting discussion um, behind the break about, uh, before the break, sorry, about the origins of, mm -hmm. um, of FGM. Um, and I think now I want to talk more about the kind of Islamic context. Um, often we hear that FGM can be attributed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. You know, is this the case? There is nothing in the sources, um, that being the Quran or the Sunnah, um, to suggest that it is a prescribed practice or a ritual for women to undergo. Um, we have obviously, and we can't, we can't deny that there has been some texts that have connected Umm Habiba um, to being a circumciser, where Prophet Muhammad وسلم, had said that it's better, um, you know, do not go to the extreme of cutting, for it's better to cut a slight yeah. than to cause her damage. Now, we can consider a large things here. We have to, to consider that Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, he did not circumcise his female children. Yeah. And we know nothing of our beloved, um, our mothers and our believers, to know that, that it was a practice that they could pass on to us. And as we know, um, this religion is so beautiful in the sense that nothing is left uncovered. Yes, absolutely. So we have to think about that in, in the terms of what is wrong, what is right within a, a husband and a wife's relations. And this is something that has not been um, covered completely. Now, if we look at that as well, how um, if there's already question marks happening and forming, if we're in doubt, then should we be leaving it out? And one of the other things I also like to, to bring to attention is that, um, you know, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, had said, do not harm yourself yes. or others. Yeah. So when we're looking at female genital mutilation and we're considering the types here, so we're looking at type three, for example, which is the most severe form of, in, and that's what we call um, professionally in terminology is infibulation, yeah. which is the complete removal of the female genital talia. And it is the covering of it and the stitching of it up, as I said earlier, leaving a small home. And then we look at type one, which we know as sunnah, as cutting, which could be anything from a prick to a piercing even, you know, okay. um, or the, just the slight removal. We're looking at all these different types. Yeah. And as we said earlier, I just wanted to clarify that it predates Islam. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so there is nothing, you know, that's saying it's actually um, a practice that has been prescribed completely. And one of the other things is finally, you know, those who are proud and arrogant or who don't want to break with their arrogant traditions will reject it, perhaps our opponents. So, alhamdulillah, you know, the Holy Quran was sent to us as an arbitrator. Yes. And this was an Islamic practice predating it. So when you look at all of these factors, then it's for yourself to decide what this practice yeah. is. Is it harmful? Look at the, 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 ben, you know, the benefits of it and look at the effects of it. Yeah, it's yeah. so severe yeah. in that sense that I can't see how we could connect that yeah. to such a peaceful, beautiful religion. Absolutely. I think you made a really good point there. You know, everything in, in our, uh, our religion, everything that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is something of benefit to us. If we see something that's kind of hugely destructive, you know, how can we argue that this has come from the Prophet, peace be upon him? It, we can't argue that because it doesn't. There's nothing, there's no Quran in the text of Quran. It's not there. Even when we look at hadith, uh, within the hadith, Sahih Bukhari, the, uh, the, which is deemed as the most authentic book of traditions, mm -hmm. the, there's no evidence of it. We look in Sahih Muslim, the same. However, <clears throat> when we look at um, Abu Dawood, there may be a hadith on it, but it's weak. It's weak yeah. in fabrication, so, and it's substandard, so we can't really use that. And even yeah. then, when, when we look at Abu Dawood's account in Islamic law of it, he's actually reported to have said, the tradition reporting female circumcision has many different versions, and each of them are substandard, unsound, and seriously doubtful. Now, again, taking that on board, if something is very doubtful, unsound, and substandard, what does that tell you? That yeah. there has, it hasn't got a legitimate basis within that. However, in recent years, yes, we have had people, um, particularly with um, the Malaysian Islamic Council giving anomalous, and I say that emphatically, <laughs> anomalous um, fatwa saying that it's oh, that it's actually allowed. This position is completely wrong. And um, Suri Kemp, who is an activist from the Muslim feminist organization um, Sisters in Islam, even said many people are doing it because they believe it is wajib, meaning obligatory or mandatory in Islam, a belief that was reinforced by this fatwa. Yet there is nothing in Quran that states that uh, female circumcision is required. The bottom line is that Islam is not supposed to cause harm, um, yeah. like we just mentioned, and it's used as as a way of really weakening 
the woman's sexuality and a form of dominance, and male dominance. Yes. Sorry, and also what we have mm. to consider, some mm. amazing facts there mm. and some great points, is that if we look at the scholars of mm. Islam, so those who may follow Imam Shafi or those who follow yeah. Hanafi or Maliki, mm. um, that there's a complete difference there within the scholars. Mm. And as we know, you know, the scholars are just humans like us, though they have obviously the knowledge more than we can comprehend, mm. but they are still just a human. And, and if there's so much differences within in the scholars that they're differing of it, then we have to be careful. Mm. And as you said, we've got with regards to the religion and the Islamic practice, mm. look at the myths that, ste that stem around mm. female genital mutilation. You know, we have a myth, for example, in some tribes where they deem the clitoris to be of, of a deadly spirit. So therefore, mm. if the clitoris was to touch the head of a baby while the woman was giving birth, then the baby will die. I think, I think you've made a really good point there about the way we use the scholars as well, the, the kind of great mm. scholars of the past. Obviously, our, um, uh, you know, our... Uh, um relationship is with the, the, the Quran and the Sunnah, not with any of the scholars. So yeah. if there's a stronger opinion or if there's any uh, um, a doubt or any, um, you know, if we have any queries over mm. anything, you know, we, we adhere only to the Quran and Sunnah rather than uh, having any particular allegiance to any um, particular scholar. So that's a really good point there. But I think with all the information that we've had this morning about FGM, what can we now say about female circumcision and its permissibility? Um, Sister Yaz, I'm going to come to you first. I think the term female circumcision is um, highly offensive to not just feminists but those who campaign for women's rights because it's not circumcision you are mutilating the girl and the reason being is because e even if we look at those who call it a sunnah it's not a sunnah those hadith will have been fabricated fabricated and they are very weak and you know huge scholars of Islam have said that female genital mutilation is barbaric and these hadith are weak and you shouldn't be listening to people who have been um, said to be fabricating and also being deceitful in the past and so why should we listen to those people who are claiming it's sunnah when it's not and it's been predating Islam in, in the first place and exactly it predated Islam and we know that Islam came about to rectify the things Absolutely. that were happening before that time and if we look at female um, circumcision as you, you know as we can call it then we look at the fact that it's also it's a monetary you know, it was an income for many circumcisers. Yeah. So when we consider that aspect and how Prophet Muhammad Wasallam was counteracting things that were happening in the past, yeah. then we have we have an open book here. Yeah. And we find that female circumcision is not even a religious issue at all. They didn't even make it a religious issue. Rather, it arises out of custom, out of and tradition, culture. And, yeah. and, culture yeah. and its personal preference. Yeah. The only firm conclusion that can be ascertained through our evidences um, from this analysis is that it's something that's actually custom, and the Holy Prophet did not declare it in Islamic law to be valid. It's haram, and he, haram and he advised against it. And so that's basically it. It's mainly down to personal preference and custom. And also, if it was a son of the Prophet, you would have seen the Prophet, peace be upon him, um, practicing it on his girls. His yes. girls were not mutilated, yeah. and so we shouldn't be doing that either. And, and as, you know, as we as we said earlier, how you know there has been nothing really in that sense for us as women mm. to follow. Um, I should my you know my will be pleased with her that there is nothing left uncovered. You know, mm -hmm. even down to our menstruation. Alhamdulillah, you know, yeah. we, we have we have everything that we need <laughs> to know. Absolutely. So why I would we have let this um, be? Just up? finally, we want to um, you know obviously this may be a affecting some of our viewers and some people watching. So I think finally, just to end, could we um, maybe give some advice to people who, yeah. um, you know, kind of may be facing the situation, who may be faced with a decision or maybe living with the consequences? Um, Sister May, I mean, would you like to uh, start with that, inshallah? Inshallah. And as I said at the beginning, it's a very sensitive topic. Yeah. It's a very complex topic. As, as you know, I work with um, the community, female genital mutilation. I work with professionals and giving training to professionals because the new man mandatory law says that they have to be fully trained in this now um, and it, it's important that we educate to eradicate yes. and it is a very sensitive topic and we're working with the community yeah. we're not working against them um, and it's really important that if you know anybody wants to get in touch even with the Islam channel if they want to give a call if they want to have that extra support we are here the Tulip Trust are here to support them as well so I think that's that's kind of a really uh, you know a really good uh, point to make there that obviously there are organizations there yes. that can help Help. Um, and obviously, um, you know, if anybody is affected by this or has any questions to ask, to email in, and we can obviously pass it on to professionals such as yourself uh, yes, to deal with that, inshallah. inshallah. Um, and Sister Nusra, have you got any, um, you know, final uh, um, take-home messages or advice for anybody watching who could be, uh, you know, suffering from the effects of this in any way? Just to remember that you're not alone. You shouldn't feel ashamed of having undergone it. Um, <clears throat> you should, um, again, contact um, professionals and people you know to actually give you that counselling, but also within the Muslim community please look at scriptures please yeah. um, 
um, take the time out to actually look at evidences and actually decide for sometimes for yourself. Do not be don't yield to your culture. Try and yield to the Islamic um, understandings. Yeah, I think Definitely. that's a really good point to end on. Actually, obviously, yeah. um, our religion, Islam, yeah. and this is Islam based on evidence and scripture has to come uh, before anything. You know, yes. culture or a family, any kind of okay. connection. So a fantastic point and some fantastic points made there. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, a very fruitful and enlightening discussion regarding such controversial and often heated topic. It's clear that FGM is something which is completely forbidden in Islam. This has been made clear not just by contemporary <coughs> scholars, but also by the great Muslim scholars of the past. And a clear distinction has also been made regarding the different types of circumcision. And as Muslims, we must ensure that our actions are always rooted in knowledge and evidence. And finally, to adhere to the advice of our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Give up what is doubtful for you, for that which is for that what is not doubtful. For truth is peace of mind, and falsehood is doubt. And that's recorded by our termody. If you missed any of the, sh uh, the show today or any of the shows this week, you can catch up with the highlights this Sunday at 3 p.m. Inshallah. Or why not catch up with us on YouTube? Here are the details. <laughs>